72 names of demons to the work on the Temple of Solomon. The difference between the lesser and greater keys of Solomon the king is accentuated and expanded upon by comparing the mythology regarding demons being the builders of Solomon's temple to the craft of free and accepted speculative masonry. Blue Lodge Freemasonry's primary myth is of the building of Solomon's temple. It's designed by Hiram Abiff, a Tyrian, and his betrayal and murder by three construction workers. Does this mean that these three traitorous killers were actually from among the 72 names of demons in the Goetia? Here we see the secret seal of Solomon from the Goetia or Lesser Key. The anagram around the edge of the seal is an acronym. The notericon of this phrase is understanding of one of the Freemasonic lost words. The anagram around the outside of the secret seal of Solomon depicts sigils or automatic writing signatures in an alienated cursive script-like form. However, to one familiar with this topic from the Masonic point of view, who would know where to look for a comparison between traits in the Dark Age grimoires about the Goetia and use of demons as workers on Solomon's temple on the one hand, and on the other hand the secret society which was formed around the same time as the Dark Age grimoires were forged, e.g. F and A.M., the similarity to the Royal Arch Capstone, the stone the builders rejected, is obvious. So this is often the first place of conjunction many Masons come into the study of all this material through, rather like fitting an elephant through a pinhole. In this 17th century wood carving, we see a scene depicting Solomon using a magic ring of power to control a host of demons, including among who is, we are told, Baalzebul, the Lord of the Flies, whose title is Baal, and whose name is Zebub. Baal Zebub was a predecessor to the demon Belial, written of by the Essenes of Qumran in the War Scroll as the father of all lies, and who was called, by the era of the Dark Age grimoire's composition, Belier. Likewise, Lucifer to the early Christians had become Lucifuge Rovacale by the time of the grimoires. Solomon was, even according to the biblical accounts, not a strict adherent of monotheism. It may be possible he believed that by hiring a force of 72 work overseers for a larger number of crews, he was honoring the monotheist god of Moses, emulating the 72 Shimham Farash in his Goetia. However, to the stricter monotheist priest class of Solomon's era, Solomon's methods were heretical and so they accused him of worshipping demons, specifically the fallen angels from the era of the Book of Enoch, which had, by the era of Solomon, become known as demons. Later still, as recently as the 20th century AD, there has been a strong resurgence of occult interest in this entire line of reasoning that has occurred due, largely, to the Golden Dawn members' releasing of their translations or interpretations of the Dark Ages grimoires. In this diagram from S. L. McGregor Mathers and Aleister Crowley's 20th century of the Gothia, we see the triangle of conjuring into which the gesturing Magus would seek to visualize his desired demon into being, and the magic circle of the magician's craft inside which the Magus stood to protect themselves from any adverse effects of their sorcery occurring in their surrounding environment. The angelic names of the Exodus verse Shimham Farash appear on the coiled serpent symbolizing the Magus' magic circle. Such is the current condition in which we find the most prevalent knowledge about the Shimham Farash, name of God, based on the 360 solas per annum calendar of prehistoric mankind. In this colorized version of the same diagram, we see even more clearly that the blue hexagrams inside the circle are meant to keep the energy from outside out 
and that the red pentagrams outside the circle are meant to keep the energy from the inside in. The hexagram is the symbol of the macrocosm and the pentagram of the microcosm. Thus, because this ritual and all related forms of conjuring constitutes the practice of black magic and thus is accredited first to the grimoires of King Solomon, and because of the injunction against the practice of any form of ritual black magic, all forms of such evocation are prescribed by the monotheist deity from the book of Leviticus onward, and remain so today. However, deeply buried beneath this moral morass of reasons not to practice magic is the truth about this system originally representing a prehistoric calendar. The trick to reading the Goetic Shemhamphorash as a calendar is to read it as upon the back of the coiled serpent. Thus, this form of the calendar model coils, or rather, spirals. The trick is to read it like one would read the Rose Cross Layman, which has three layers of petals, the outermost of twelve, the middle of seven, and the innermost of three. When one constructs a sigil pattern by using the Rose Cross layman as a template, one takes each letter of the name and finds its location among the 22 Hebrew letters marking the petals of the Rose Cross layman, then connects the dots in sequence. The resulting vector pathway appears flat, but could also be seen as occupying depth in a third dimension by considering the Rose Cross layman itself as if it were, like a real rose, comprised of three layers of petals, each layer of different depth. The entire point of creating sigils, however, is to summon universal energy, to assume strength for your own will over natural elemental forces by forging their seal to summon it. Because the thorns of this rose are poisonously fatal, sigil magic is prescribed in Leviticus. However, the Golden Dawn restarted the open practice of it by distributing and explaining the Rose Cross Layman. Just as the Rose Cross Layman symbolizes the rotation of the three top petals, the three alchemical elements, the seven middle petals, the seven planets, the twelve lowest petals, the twelve zodiac signs, of multiple levels, all operating independently of one another, so too does the same method apply to deciphering this model, which has long baffled Mesoamerican anthropologists in its normal flat form, the Aztec calendar stone. The Aztec stone is meant to imply the depth of a round conical tower seen from above. In the middle is the large face of Tezcatlipoca, the fifth sun. Surrounding him are the smaller faces of the four other world suns or Aztec eons. One step lower down from this level we find the ring of twenty day names, Aztec months. One step below these are eight dividing arrows, and beyond them in the outer ring are twelve glyphs hidden as scales on twin snakes with human faces wrapped around upward from the bottom on either side with the thirteenth symbol being shared by both, to total the thirteen day names of Aztec weeks. The method of reading the Aztec calendar stone is to think of it as looking down on an upright tower. The myth regarding the Tower of Babel is that it was built by mankind because they wanted to make a name for themselves and to become like unto the god of contemporary monotheism i.e. Marduk. This only aroused their god's displeasure, and the result of their attempt to please him by emulation of him was the confusion of the tongues, whereby all the various different regionally evolved languages spoken today were first given to mankind, and we were all made to speak in them. This is significant because it puts the date of the first alphabets around the time of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah following the global flood, prior to Abraham's leaving Ur and entering Egypt. This is contemporary, historically speaking, to the era of the end of the Sumero-Akkadian Golden Age and the beginning of the Babylonian Empire. 
Thus, the Tower of Babel has come to symbolize God's wrath at mankind's hubris. To Ganesh, the avatar of Brahma, the creator. To Vishnu, the preserver, who was Buddha, who was Krishna, who will be Maitreya. To Shiva, the destroyer, and her manifestation as the Yuga of Kali. To the religion of the Hebrews, the Reform, Orthodox, and Hasidic. To the religion of all Christendom, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant. To the religion of Islam, the Sevener Ishmaeli, the Twelver Shiites, and the Sunni. Let the tower symbolize a warning of fate's dissatisfaction with greed. And remember the symbol of the New World Order is the eye in the triangle printed on money. Religious Metaphysics Part 2 In Reality Part 1 Modern Science Part 1a Personal Electromagnetism The soul is known as the spark of life in the West and as chi energy in the East. It is called the Ruach, breath of life, in Hebrew, the Ba, energy shadow, in ancient Egyptian, and the Aura, vehicle or Vimana, in Vedic India. The soul is, in Buddhism, the Tao of Zen, or way of nothingness. The soul is what buffers external stimuli by narrowing the focus of our ordinarily infinite perception. The soul is like the outer wall of a biological cell of which our mind is the nucleus. Our soul is like an electron in an orbital energy level cloud, and our mind is like the quarks bound by gluons in the atomic nucleus. The soul is a biologically built electromagnetic cyclotron. The soul is a stable wormhole, inside of which we are just a brain on a shelf. Here we see the pattern formed by a single vector on the surface of a four sphere or tube torus when seen from above its poles. This was long believed to be the shape of the soul, though invisible to most, that surrounds every living being with an aura. This pattern arises from a magnetic dipole effect. A magnet was once thought to only be a piece of metallic iron ore that would always point in the same direction when set into a puddle of water. Now it is known that the magnetic effect is co-joined to the electromagnetic spectrum of radiation, such that a strong enough magnetic field, such as at the poles of a planet, can bend light, causing auroras. The concept of a magnetic dipole is simple. It has a positive end that attracts to the nearest, strongest, negative source of magnetism. This is marked as pointing north in the diagram. The opposite side from this is magnetically negative, meaning it repels from other similar negative poles. This is marked as pointing south in the diagram. This diagram shows small filings of metallic iron ore as they appear under the influence of a dipolar magnet. This shape also depicts the cross-section of a tube torus. The Earth itself has a soul. By the criteria of a soul being a toroidal electromagnetic field 